So what is wokeism, this new virus that's both uh, parasitic and also pernicious? A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So with me here today to talk about what is wokeism is Dr. Frances Widdowson. She's a professor and author and a senior fellow at Frontier. Welcome, Frances. Thanks for having me on. Well, Francis, I'm uh, delighted that you're here today. And um, this is a fascinating topic because we hear a lot about wokeism. It's used not only as a noun, an adjective, a verb. Um, it, it's kind of confusing, uh, I think, to a lot of Canadians. So in simple terms, what is wokeism? Wokeism is identity politics that has become totalitarian. So that is, a, I think, is a very concise definition and gets to the heart of the situation. And in order for that to occur, what happened, uh, it, it initiated, it emerged in the 1960s. So the, the, the ground was created uh, in the 1960s with postmodernism, which was a reactionary position that was attacking the Enlightenment which was insisting that objectivity didn't exist and everything was subjective. And if you made some kind of claim about an objective truth that could be shared by all, this was a power ploy uh, trying to maintain uh, some kind of wow. oppressed position. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a huge summary. Um, yeah. Lots of terms there. So basically, if you had to simplify it though, um, yep. wokeism, it's kind of an ideo ideology that says there's no objective truth and that like, it's, it's a way of thinking though about, it's a way, a lens of looking at the world. Is that right? It is, but the, uh, the no objective truth aspect, which is postmodernism was what made wokeism possible. So wokeism is the identity politics, uh, which you know used to exist as just one perspective amongst many in the universities. Now with wokeism, it is that you must accept the subjective beliefs of uh, members of groups who are perceived to be oppressed. Um, so just as an example, like perhaps if I gave an example that might be helpful, which is uh, trans activism, which is one of the, 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 the most extreme forms of wokeism. Um, if you are born male uh, with XY chromosomes and you believe that you are a woman, everyone else must accept that you are a woman because this is a way in which uh, you will be, that this uh, member of an oppressed group will be empowered. So it's the identity politics kind of idea combined with the totalitarian uh, type of impulse, okay. which is like the two kind of components of wokeism. So I remember years ago, there was a lot of phrases like, wow, you, you're really politically correct or you're yes. politically correct. Yes. Um, and it had this kind of edgy judgmentalism to it. And there was a kind of a right way of thinking. It was almost absurd. Yeah. And so it sounds like political correctness, but on steroids, but with this really kind of authoritarian edge and it's going everywhere. Is that a kind of yeah. a, another way to summarize it? I think so. I wrote an article a few years ago uh, talking about what I called politically correct totalitarianism and was taken from some work that uh, a grad student of Jordan Peterson did on uh, politically correct authoritarianism. I think totalitarianism is a better word because they're trying to change how you think about things. Like they're very, very interested in changing language. Mm. As Orwell, George Orwell pointed out, you know, 50 years ago, um, changing language so your thoughts are transformed. That, that's mm. a very, very important part of wokeism. So politically correct totalitarianism, the political correctness that we saw in the 90s 
this is now um, the totalitarian character of it is that you, everyone must abide by this. Okay. Before it was just kind of shaming people and saying, you know, you're being rude. That was kind of the uh, kind of response. Now it is, if you don't accept this, you will be subject to uh, legal types of sanctions. And this is wow. coming. This is already here. And this is gaining momentum as we speak. Okay. Because, I mean, some of this is confusing and, you know, you want to be careful about generalizations, but this is a very strong trend. It's it's seeping into all aspects of society. So we're going to talk about that today. Yeah. And- I remember years ago, we kind of, um, frankly, joke about people who'd be very politically correct because we'd say, well, they, they lack common sense. I mean, whoever thinks um, the way some of these people do, it, it's, it's utterly bizarre. Mm-hmm. Um, but their realm, they're going into a realm from, like, it's one thing just to assert your opinion. It's mm-hmm. another thing to use the state and other actors, even corporations today are going woke. Yeah. That power to kind of force it on people. So you use a very powerful analogy about wokeism as being like a parasite. What do you mean by that? I think you use the the analogy of the wasp. Yes. So this is not my, this I should give a shout out to uh, Christopher Nagel, who wrote a book called The Secular Fundamentalist. Um, Christopher Nagel calls the kind of environment in which wokeism thrives, the jewel wasp of indulgence capitalism. And what we're seeing, and it's not just wokeism, according to him, it's a, it's a wider kind of corporate speak, um, and but wokeism is part of it, whereby, um, and the jewel wasp is, for people who are not aware of it, uh, it's called the emerald jewel wasp. It is a parasitic wasp that lobotomizes cockroaches and then lays its eggs on the lobotomized cockroach. And what Nagel is getting at with that kind of grotesque metaphor is wokeism and all the various kinds of other aspects of late capitalism, which are trying to squeeze every last ounce of profit out of the system is cannibalizing all the thousands of years of infrastructure that have built up and form the basis of human progress. So what we are seeing is, is many things are being destroyed. And I think the trans, just to go back to the trans activism example, this is a very good, uh, you know, sort of way of showing this because you're actually destroying the foundations of human societies to be able to reproduce themselves by destroying sort of the relationships between the sexes and the reproductive Mm -hmm. roles that people play in society. And basically denying the essential truth of male and female. That's the way we were created. Um, Yes. You know, as precious people. And yeah, that's foundational to society. That's pretty, pretty basic, isn't it? And you're destroying it. Yes. And, you know, now we don't, we're we're having all this, these sorts of things happening in the school system. Mm -hmm. Um, It's kind of being pretended that this is just, sort of the way things are, which are just being allowed to express themselves, Mm -hmm. when what we're seeing is active attempts to encourage children to to sort of doubt their, uh, whether they're a girl or a boy and these sorts of things. And and while we might have the odd case where this is occurring, Mm -hmm. um, we have evidence that there is what's called a social contagion that is happening uh, with children and this will destroy uh, the basic fabric of society. Wow. Uh, and it's it's very, very frightening that we are allowing this to happen and we are being intimidated by these woke activists who tell everyone if they have concerns about the, the health of children, that they're a transphobe and they're a hater and all these kinds of things, which is making it impossible for us to be able to protect children which is, you know, sort of a fundamental aspect of a just society to be able to do that. In this context, yeah, how could you justify in any case, in any circumstance, sexualizing minors, children? Um, yes. So I do want to um, get to kind of a, a question around how do you know if someone or an institution could be woke and not to sound overly si- simplistic, but are there kind of like five key questions to ask to kind of reflect on, well, is this person woke? Any advice there? 
Yes, yeah, so th they would be the two kinds of uh, aspects of wokeism, which is one, the totalitarianism, and one is the identity politics. Okay, no, uh, but what, what do you mean by these terms? These are these are academic terms. What what yeah, so, from a Canadian common sense point of view, what would be the five questions? So uh, cancellation is a good example of this. So do you want to shut down speech instead of encouraging open inquiry and discussion? Okay. So that would be one question. Is the person advocating canceling your speech because, well, we just don't want to hear that other point of view. We don't want to have a healthy debate. That would be a good yes. question. Okay. Yes. Is uh, subjectivity, is it being demanded that subjectivity be prized over objectivity? Okay, so the example would be gender. Gender so, is fluid and exactly. you can be whatever you want to be. Is that right? Yeah, so the fact that you have a particular biology is really not what's important. Uh, what's important is uh, uh, that you think, you, you believe that this is the case. Okay. Um, other uh, aspects which are very common are, are the kind of this intersectionality idea. So you have this Whoa. intersectional. What does intersectionality mean? That's a huge term. What, what is that yes. about? So, uh, this is a term that was put forward by Kimberly Crenshaw about how oppression has multiple uh, types of locations. So, for example, I am a woman and I that means I'm oppressed on that. Uh, that level, but I'm also white. What they, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see things in that way. But they would say I'm white, so that means that I'm an oppressor. So you would go through your entire kind of identity thing and ask whether you're disabled or whether you're a person of color or whether you're homosexual and and any of those things where it seemed to be an oppressed oppressor. You would add up all those uh, types of sites of oppression or being oppressed, mm -hmm. and you would place people on a scale. And depending upon how oppressed you are, that determines your right to speak. Okay. So I, I should, every time you say anything, David, I can just shout you down because I'm a woman and you're a man and I'm more oppressed than you are. And therefore I should have more right to speak. So wow. that is very, very common kind of aspect of, of wokeism. Okay, to have so those people that about. subscribe to that woke way of thinking yep. kind of give you higher points depending on the number of categories you fit that kind of victim definition. Is that right? And it's tied to speech. And it's tied to speech. So you'll often hear in conversations that people don't have a right to say what they're saying because of their particular location in this intersectional hierarchy. Wow. Okay. That's amazing. So it's not based on the quality of your idea. It's who you are identified on that scale of victimhood. Okay, yes. so those are very powerful questions. What about even assumptions about, well, let's say about who your kids belong to? Um, like, do your, do your kids belong to you as a parent or do they belong to the state to raise up in terms of education? Is that another question you could ask? Me, I, I, haven't, I haven't really, uh, certainly with the trans aspect, uh, we're seeing that now that... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which is the debate that's happening in New Brunswick right now as to whether, you know, how much should parents uh, have control over their children's education? Okay. Sorts of things. And, and just, you know, what's, what, what, what's yeah. happening in New Brunswick, uh, Francis, if you could just clarify that? Yeah, so, uh, and this is a major battleground now. And uh, if the Premier does not win <laughs> on this one, it's going to be more of a reactionary okay. Uh, kind well, of can you what, what did the premier do in New Brunswick? That's the example here um, in your site. So, uh, there was a policy. Uh, he, he changed policy so that um, teachers were no longer obligated to use uh, the pronouns and the name that a child had chosen if that child was under 16. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. And so what he was basically trying to do was to get the sort of create a situation where the parents would become involved in in knowing that this was happening and then the woke element is fighting back against that saying that you know trans students have to be protected in case their parents have a negative view of trans uh, okay. rights and so on or trans oh. identities and so on um 
And this is a major battle that's happening. And we have to be very concerned about what's happening with children here. You know, this is a bit delicate because, you know, sometimes you do have parents who are acting in a very, very oppressive way towards their children. And in, if that is happening, then, you know, the state is under obligation to intervene. So if a child is being abused by their parents, this, these sorts of things. So everyone acknowledges that, yes, there is a time for the state to step in and remove children from homes. But in the case of trans activism and this idea that, um, you know, young children can start to see themselves in this way and, and almost an encouragement of this, uh, we are seeing very, very serious consequences um, of children, you know, when they do grow up and, and reach, you know, 18 years old, having second thoughts about what happened. And this does, you know, when you're young, you often don't consider what are the implications of, of taking very, very drastic actions and chopping off body parts and doing these sorts of things, taking puberty blockers. These can have quite serious consequences for um, your life as a human being in terms of your fertility and all sorts of questions, which really, you know, children should not be making these decisions. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they, aren't, they aren't able to make those kinds of decisions. But what I find interesting then about your answer is that you're not kind of falling into the trap, I think, by a lot of people that subscribe to a woke idea is that they use a tactic of making things black or white. Um, and using kind of binary answers. So in other words, you're either for transgendered rights or you're totally against it and therefore you're bad. Is that an example then of a tactic that's often used? They make black and white thinking? It is, the tactic is that, the major tactic is we are not able to have that discussion. So cancellation, in other words. And, and censorship. Censorship, so, okay. We see that a lot. So, and there's a whole bunch of different issues now. And we see this in the universities whereby you want to just have the debate uh, put forward and then have things evaluated in terms of uh, according to reason, evidence, and logic. And you're told that this is hate speech and discrimination to be talking about this and therefore it should not be allowed. Okay. Um, you know, Lindsay Shepard, uh, which you had on the program um, quite recently, you know, she, she this is an example of what happened to her is that she wasn't really taking a position one way or another on pronouns, but she just thought that her class should be exposed to the different arguments around it. And she immediately got pulled into a disciplinary uh, meeting and told that this was completely inappropriate what she was doing. And it would be like, you know, having her students, you know, hear a speech by Adolf Hitler, you know, which is, in my view, we shouldn't be not allowing people to listen to the speeches of Adolf Hitler. We should be analyzing the speeches of Adolf Hitler to understand what the nature of the roots of fascism are. Mm -hmm, so exactly. that's kind of the academic open inquiry type of position, whereas the woke position is, is that the answer has already been found and anyone who disputes that or even wants to have a critical analysis of that particular discussion um, is obviously uh, a hate monger and a racist and a homophobe and a transphobe yeah. and so on. And they should probably be put in jail. Is, is, so, is so people who tend to think in, in, uh, you know, in terms of wokeism, they tend to believe they have the answers. And yes. how dare you, to coin the phrase mm -hmm. of, the yep. environmental activist Greta Thunberg, how dare you think outside that box and we're going to make sure by force in some measure you conform to our way of thinking. So we're going to either cancel you, censor you, shut you down. We'll even try to put you in jail through the law. So they don't believe in freedom of speech. They don't believe in that and they use words in a different way to kind of move us along this certain path of thinking. Is that, is that a fair summary? Yes, and, and they actually claim that if you are in favor of free speech, this is some kind of right-wing dog whistle that you are putting forward so that you can 
oppress people and keep down uh, those who are marginalized within society. Wow. And, and you see that argument all the time, um, which is ridiculous because free speech is one of the most progressive uh, types of ideas that we have ever developed as uh, as a species. Mm -hmm. And to have people actively trying to tear down those gains that we've made since the Enlightenment is absolutely shocking. Yeah, it really is. It's profound because freedom of speech, among other conditions, has been essential to not just the sharing of ideas as we try to respectfully get at truth, but to innovation, you can't invent, invent anything, let alone have the scientific process. Like to be oriented towards science means to be open-minded, but you can't be open-minded with science if you're woke, can you? No, and woke is anti-science. Wow. And we've seen this um, uh, with the indigenization, uh, which is another major aspect of wokeism. Mm -hmm. So wokeism, two issues, and they're heavily, uh, you know, sort of influenced by wokeism. Uh, trans activism, I was mentioned, I've already mentioned that, but indigenization is another one. So um, indigenous ways of knowing uh, is something which in the woke university, you must respect and value. So you cannot question whether indigenous ways of knowing are scientifically valid or not. Mm -hmm. And you're actually prohibited from asking questions about whether it is a valid way to try to understand the world. Okay. Because um, that would be seen as, as what? Disrespectful and racist or or what? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. so the idea again, so just in terms of the woke logic, which I'm not sure if people are, are completely understanding that, is Indigenous people, and according to this intersectional hierarchy, mm -hmm. are one of the most oppressed identities. And therefore, in order for them to overcome their oppression, their subjective beliefs must be accepted and there must it must be pretended that those subjective beliefs are actually objective. Okay. So wow. if an indigenous group believes, for example, that the creator the creator put them in North America from the beginning of time, you must pretend to accept that as being valid. Mm -hmm. Because if you do not, you will not enable that member of that oppressed group to have confidence in themselves as an indigenous person and to be able to, to you know, band together with other indigenous people and other oppressed groups to try to overcome their oppression. Okay. Uh, so it's very disturbing for the academic uh, uh, kind of realm as everything else. You know, it's the typical tactic that if you don't want to talk about an issue or debate it, you just simply shut them down and you demonize people. So in that case, does that mean that we're dealing pe with people who not only have a different worldview, they believe that the ends, like the, the, the vision of what they're working for, is justified by the means. So in other words, yeah, we're going to, I, I'm, I'm thinking of Stalin as an example. Yeah. I remember Stalin saying, if it takes breaking a few eggs to get to our communist utopia, then that's okay. Is that, is that what's going on here? Yes, uh, there. The as we mentioned before, the answer is already decided. This is the right answer. This is the right way in which people are supposed to act, and the right goals. and And often the goals are are things that people would agree with. Like everyone agrees that uh, you know Indigenous people have been treated terribly uh, throughout history. Um, it's important to try to deal with the terrible social conditions in Indigenous communities. But, but in order to reach that goal, that doesn't mean that one has to pretend to agree with the views of some Indigenous people, not all Indigenous people, mm -hmm. the views of some Indigenous people that, um, you know, there, there's 215 murdered children uh, in the apple orchard in the Kamloops Indian Residential School, or that, you know, Indigenous science uh, is something that should be taught in the school system mm -hmm. as a as science, or um, various healing remedies which have been shown not to be effective should be promoted for Indigenous people, and so on. Mm. So, 
the goal which wokeism uses, like that's what it relies upon, is is sort of appealing to people's sense of justice uh, that they want to see change for uh, certain groups of people who are not doing very well in society. It uses that to say, well, if you want that, then you must accept these uh, ways of going about it, which Mm -hmm. has not been demonstrated to be effective in doing what it's claimed to do. But as soon as you raise questions about that, you get hit with all sorts of accusations that you're obviously a hate monger and a a person who wants to discriminate against Mm -hmm. people. But if I was to ask you a question, Francis, um, as we wrap up things, what could you as a citizen do in your personal life to help turn the tide of this woke uh, nonsense? I think, you know, as one person, your, your influence is limited. Yeah. But if you can devise methods to uh, get some kind of political group together, and it's by kind of coordinating people um, that then you can actually have some kind of effect. Um, individually, it's important as an individual to not violate your own principles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francis Widowson, for joining us in this conversation about understanding the confusing world of wokeism and what's going on and its impact in our society. I think you're an inspiring leader who, with your courage, has also challenged us to think about what we can do and to not be afraid, but to act thoughtfully and uh, with others so that we can be able to stand up for truth and to also help build our and renew our country. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.